Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump right in. Our company name is Minerva. Um, this is just some data about the company. We've been doing this for 14 years now. We started off as a cancer company, and you'll see the connection as I go through it. Uh, we've raised all private money, $38 million to date, and we have some um, industry partnerships that should be coming up. Um, so we are focused on the space between stem cells and cancer cells. And we discovered that a clipped form of MUC1, the mucin-1 protein, it has to be clipped by an enzyme uh, to go from the quiescent state to the active state. And we call that clipped form MUC1 star. We also discovered its activating ligand, which is NM23. It only activates the receptor if it's in the dimeric form. And uh, together, these two molecules, the NM23 is the growth factor, MUC1 star is the growth factor receptor, they mediate the growth of 100% of all pluripotent stem cell growth and keep them in the undifferentiated state and they mediate the growth and uh, metastatic potential of 75% of all human cancers. So uh, we also showed that this uh, MUC1 star NM23 is what allows cancer cells to evade chemotherapy, and we've published that. Um, we also figured out the exact molecular details of how this pair um, is involved in a feedback loop. So the paradox was, how do stem cells know when to stop acting like pluripotent cell cells and initiate differentiation? We figured out that feedback loop. We also figured out some clever ways that cancer cells have developed to evade that feedback loop. And we take advantage of that to make stem cells grow without spontaneously differentiating until we pull the trigger. And we also now know how to stop uh, cancer cell growth. So I'll show you the mechanisms. So, um, which one? This one. Okay, so for about 25 years, what was known is that um, MUC1 was very interesting because on healthy cells, the protein was all clustered uh, at one point on the cell surface, while on cancer cells, it spread all over the whole surface. We discovered that there's a self-aggregation domain similar to beta amyloid self-aggregation, and that keeps the MUC1 all clustered together on a healthy cell so that the growth factor cannot get in and cannot deliver a growth or pluripotency signal. Only stem cells and cancer cells secrete NM23. So the MUC1 on cancer cells and stem cells is clipped. They secrete NM23. The NM23 as a dimer binds to the extracellular part of the MUC1 receptor, and that is what promotes pluripotency, either, both in a stem cell and a cancer cell. We've proven this, we've published it. Uh, if you take the one-legged antibody, the FAB, against the MUC1 star receptor, um, and you use that on cancer cells, those cells then take on all the molecular characteristics of a stem cell that is maturing or differentiating. So we block the pluripotent or the stem-like characteristics of cancer cells. Mature cells don't continuously divide. That's the end of the tumor. So what is the feedback loop that allows stem cells to know that when it's time to begin differentiation? Well, I've told you that um, stem cells, it's only the dimeric form of NM23 that activates this pathway. So as your stem cells begin to multiply, the amount of NM23 increases. It then goes to hexamer. And the window at which it goes from a dimer to a hexamer is a very narrow uh, band of concentrations. Now, the hexamer does not bind to the MUC1 star receptor. And if you take um, stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, and treat them with hexameric NM23, they instantly differentiate. Same thing with cancer cells. So um, 
Okay, so when you look at the, some of the molecular markers, when you treat stem cells with dimeric NM23, all of the pluripotency genes uh, are upregulated. Uh, when you uh, treat a, a stem cell or a cancer cell with hexameric uh, NM23 or the FAB, the one-legged antibody, which we have the most data on, uh, that cell will start um, decreasing pluripotency markers, and they increase micro-145. And for those of you who study stem cell differentiation, micro-145 is the microRNA that signals the stem cell to leave pluripotency and begin differentiating. We can do that same thing if we add the uh, synthetic peptide that corresponds to the extracellular domain of MUC1 star. So you add the synthetic peptide, it binds up all the dimeric NM23, the cells instantly differentiate, and the differentiation is synchronized, which I'll show you. So this is just, a, I hope I don't insult anybody, but this is a little cartoon of how things are currently done. Every other stem cell media contains FGF. Um, so the most widely used form is you have mouse feeder cells that secrete something that lets stem cells grow, and uh, FGF is added to the media. The mouse feeder cells serve two purposes. The first purpose is the uh, stem cells are non-adherent, so that makes the stem cells stick to the mouse feeder cells. The second region, reason is that they secrete something that makes the stem cells grow pluripotently. Another, another method of growing stem cells is you can put them on matrigel. If you go to matrigel, you still have to add the unknown secretions that come from the mouse feeder cells. And now others are adding a, a lot of FGF with TGF beta and using as the substrate different kinds of integrins. Integrins send a biological signal to the cells, and that has an outcome. We've shown if the integrin is vitronectin, it changes the stem cells in one way. If it's laminin, it changes the stem cells in another way. It is in no way inert. And we've heard from many collaborators uh, who are actually in the industry making stem cells uh, differentiate into known things that they have to continuously go back to the mouse feeder cells or the cells lose their uh, ability to differentiate into cardiomyocytes uh, and the like. So this is our system. It's very simple. Um, our surface is the antibody that, it's a bivalent antibody. It dimerizes the MUC1 star receptor just like NM23. NM23 goes to the nucleus and has another function as well, so we need both. Um, the surface antibody has a tighter, a stronger affinity than the NM23 that we're adding, but those are the two factors, um, and the media is a minimal media, no other cytokine, no other growth factor. Uh, we do add the uh, synthetic peptide to uh, initiate differentiation. So one of the things that we found uh, quite by accident is that when we grow stem cells this way, you can take a regular stem cell line that's in what they call the primed state, which is a misnomer, and uh, grow it through uh, five passages. The cells will be 50% in the naive state. By 10 passages, they're 100% in the naive state. And I'll tell you what that means in a minute. Um, it basically means that the cells look identical to cells that are taken from the inner mass of an embryo. So these are stem cells in the ground state, which turns out to be very important. So here's a comparison of um, different, stem, different naive versus primed genes. Uh, Rudy Yanish and Jennifer Nichols uh, put together lists of genes that are indicative of the naive state versus the primed state. And we took the same cells and we grew them in different things, either our NM23, FGF, or MTZER. And what you can see is that uh, our stuff is in red, high naive gene expression, very low primed gene expression. Um, the control we used is FGF on MEFs, 
And uh, we normalized everything there to one because that's the standard. Uh, M-teaser actually is the worst for having very low expression of the naive genes, very high expression of the prime genes. And this is just the gold standard mark of how you measure whether a cell is really naive or primed. Both Xs are activated when we grow them in NM23. If you treat them with FGF, they go to the primed state within four passages. They're 100% primed. And I'll show you what difference that makes. Here, we've grown cells in NM23 or FGF and let them passively differentiate. And I'll draw your attention to the ones going down the neuronal pathway. These are the FGF-grown cells. Every place where there's blue, that's a cell nucleus. And you can see you could have a toenail developing next to your brain cell. And we know that that doesn't work. If the cells are grown in our system, every cell in a local environment is all going down the same pathway. And they're all connected to each other. Um, could you start the video, please? These are cardiomyocytes. Uh, we grew cells for axiogenesis uh, using the NM23 method, and they turned them into cardiomyocytes. And this is, uh, this is the control. So these were grown in FGF. And you can see they're only twitching, really. And we'll go to the next one. If you could start this video, please. These are the cells, same starting cells. We just grew them in the NM23. Um, they're beating in a synchronized way, strength of contraction. And whereas the 2 million cells with the standard method turned into 250,000 to 500,000 cardiomyocytes, these cells continued to multiply as they differentiated. The 2 million turned into 10 million. And you could see that those cells could really pump blood. Um, so just in summary, the big advantages of getting cells into the naive state, we think that that clears a major bottleneck that has been holding back the stem cell industry. Lots of things can be done in mouse stem cells because the uh, mouse lip always put mouse stem cells back into the naive state. So this is the first, uh, first time that we can grow genetically unmodified stem cells. They're all in the naive state. They have a higher cloning efficiency. They do not spontaneously differentiate. It can be used to make iPS cells as well in a, a system that's free of feeder cells and FGF. Um, we have all of the uh, issued, uh, all of the um, freedom to operate patents have issued in the US and Europe. Uh, the company, I think we're up to 128 patent applications. Many, many have issued in all of the key countries involved in stem cell research. Um, I'm going to thank you and end there. Um, we have 50 seconds for questions.